Hello beauties, buckle up because it's gonna be a wild video. It's one that I haven't done anything like before. Um, I'm very nervous about it if I'm being 100% honest. It has caused me a great deal of stress and anxiety over the past couple days, but I think it's going to be an interesting video and I hope you guys enjoy it as much as, um, as I have enjoyed working on it even though it stressed me out. So what we're doing today, I wanted to do a full face review of the Ipsy Glam Bag Plus. So what I'm gonna do, because this particular glam bag features a product from one of my favorite YouTubers. Um, actually, she probably is my favorite YouTuber, if I'm being honest. Um, Bailey Sarian did a collab palette with uh, Estate. It is the Venice Fling palette. It's absolutely gorgeous. I'm so excited about it. The colors are beautiful. They're right up my alley with the oranges and the purple and this really beautiful yellow. I'm just so excited to work with it. Um, huge pans, absolutely great amount of product that you're getting with this. I'm, I'm so excited. If you don't know Bailey Sarian, I highly recommend you, um, you check her out. She's amazing. She's hysterical and beautiful. And she does something on Mondays called Murder Mystery Makeup Monday. And she talks about true crime. Uh, which is actually how I found her. And then after I realized that I just loved her personality, I started watching all of her videos. Um, but her murder mystery makeup ones are definitely my favorites. So as a backstory, um, if you guys are new to the channel, hi, I'm Andy. I am a makeup enthusiast and um, I also have a history degree. So we've done, I've talked about it on the channel and then we've done one video so far where I use my history degree to kind of tell you guys something that I've studied. Since it's gonna be a full face, there's a lot of products that are gonna be used. It's gonna be a long video. I wanted to make it entertaining for you. So the best way I knew how to do that was to pick a historical topic and talk about it. And since I'm doing a Bailey Sarian's palette, I figured I would shoot Let's try it. Let's try and not stutter my way through this video. I don't know if I'm capable of it, but I'm gonna do my best. I decided to choose a topic that is kind of in line with what she normally does. It is historically significant. That was something I wanted to do. So it was like all true crime obviously has, it's all historical because it's all happened in the past. So. I've said it before, if it happened yesterday, it's technically history. So every true crime case is history, but this one is um, wild. <sighs> I chose to do H.H. Holmes, who has been deemed America's first serial killer. Very hard to prove. Uh, it's really more of just like, he's one of the biggest uh, known serial killers in American history. One of the originals, one of the OGs, if you will. I thought, I originally thought about doing uh, Jack the Ripper and I thought that was gonna be too complicated. So I decided H.H. Holmes would be a little bit easier. Uh, and then I was wrong because <laughs> because it wasn't, it was very stressful. I have like 17 pages of notes. So it's it's gonna be a ride. The way I approach history, uh, it's very much like science in my opinion. I come up with a thesis, a, hy a hypothesis if you will, and I will um, research the hell out of it. And then I determine, <laughs> Sometimes I, I feel like I know where this is gonna go and then my opinion changes based on the research. Truthfully, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, up front tell you guys that my version of H.H. Holmes is probably not the one that you would expect. Um, after doing research, I think a lot of what we know about him is um, not true. <laughs> Wild! Might as well start the makeup. Um, before I jump into that, I will say I didn't want to do my eyebrows on camera because I just absolutely hate it. I hate doing my eyebrows on camera. So I, I went ahead and do those. So I've used two products. I use my Murad uh, Hydrating uh, Perfect hydration perfecting day cream. Honestly, I thought it was gonna be kind of like a moisturizer. It's a hydrating sunscreen is what I would call it. it smells like a sunscreen, very lightweight though. I really liked it. Um, it's just not something that I need to use right now because I have no intention of leaving my house today. So, like besides in the middle of the night when I go to work, which you guys know I do. So like, I mean, it was a waste of a little bit of product, but I think it's a good one to have like, you know, for pool days and, you know, going out into the sun, it's always smart to protect. So I actually really like this one and I'm a big Murad fan. So I was, yes, I was very excited about that. That was one of the ones they chose for me. That was not one of the ones that I was able to pick. Um, I did pick this uh, product though, and I have already used that. It is the Wander Beauty, uh, just clear little gel for your eyebrows. I just did it to kind of um, smooth out my eyebrows and keep them in place before I added any sort of color product. So um, yeah, worked really well. Very nice little pointy fine tip really gets in there and, and gets them all like nice and separated. So I was a big fan of that and um, I've heard great stuff about Wander Beauty. So I was like, cool. I also have the uh, the Ciate London Watermelon Burst Setting Powder, which I will be using. I'm gonna try and use these. I don't know if I'm going to be able to. They are um, Beauty For Real, two little um, 
I can't think of the word. Eyeshadow crayons, that's what they are, they're eyeshadow crayons. So um, if I can use them, I wanna focus on the palette so they may not get used. Um, I also did grab some, three of my items that I got from BoxyCharm just because, why, might as well, right? Um, I've got the Born This Way concealer. I've got the Clarins Paris Velvet Lip Perfector. And then I've got the Thank Me Later eyeshadow primer. So I'll use all of those. I'm not really gonna focus on the um, the products just because there's so much to talk about with the story, but I will focus on the palette when I get to that. So yeah, and I may mention just the, the, the products and stuff as we go, but it, we'll just have to see. Like I said, this is probably gonna be a long video, so buckle up. Before I start, I do wanna just give the disclaimer. Um, I did as thorough of research as I possibly could. There is a lot of a lot of information that contradicts one another. I think partially it's because th this case has been so over sensationalized. And I think it's also partially because it was so long ago um, because uh, when we're looking at the 1800s, the late 1800s, there's a lot of issues kind of finding sources that I, I think are reliable. And that's part of the issues with this case. I tried to be as thorough as possible. I tried to, um, to use <laughs> my deductive reasoning and my researching skills to, um, now that I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and get into the makeup, so we're gonna do the concealer. But I tried to do as much as I possibly could um, to ensure that I wasn't giving you guys any misinformation, but it is, there is a lot out there that it just is incredibly hard to sift through. Um, I spent about five days doing research. I mean, I wasn't like, it wasn't like I was only doing research. I mean, I, you know, I was doing other stuff too, but I would probably, probably spend a good like 10 hours or so <laughs> between watching videos and documentaries and reading source material and things like that. So this is what I think happened. This is what I think that historically um, we have enough proof to back up. I could be wrong. I, I mean, I'm not saying I'm an expert. I am nowhere near an expert. I was not there. I don't know exactly what happened, but this is what, if I had to, um, if I had to say what I think went down, this is what I would predict would be at least somewhat close to, to what we, we can say happened here. So um, I will also say this is, of course, this is a true story. This is, you know, there are parts of it that I think are um, exaggerated, but without a doubt, I mean, people lost their lives. And I mean, no disrespect to anybody in the story that I'm talking about. Um, I am approaching it from a historical point of view, but I also, <laughs> I also have a bad tendency of like making jokes when I'm uncomfortable. So it's possible I may say something. I don't mean anything offensively. I am trying to give you guys the best information possible. But um, but yeah, so that's my, my little spiel before we jump in here. So let us start talking about H.H. Holmes. To start, Let's talk about what people probably have heard if they know anything about this case. So H.H. H. Holmes was, um, he was born in the mid 1800s. They claimed that he was incredibly intelligent, basically a boy genius, that he, um, he had this um, almost like, unbelievable intelligence for such a young child. From a young age, he was kind of interested in medicine and and some cases, um, some people have said that he was abused by his father. Some pretty horrible rumors about his father, that his father was an alcoholic and um, to punish the kids when they were bad, he would use like chloroform rags or he'd lock them in attics. And that is partially why he he turned into the, the serial killer he did. There were, Rumors that he had, you know, practiced mutilating animals and stuff like that. There was even, he did experience, it was confirmed that he actually witnessed the death of a friend when he was 11 years old. Some people have claimed that he actually killed his friend because he wanted to know what the inside of a, a human body looked like. Basically what happens is he grows up, he becomes an adult, he becomes a doctor and he kind of commits all this insurance fraud, runs amok. Then he builds this murder castle and it's, it's, it's described as like this huge castle, a factory for death is what some people have called it. It had secret rooms and tunnels and hidden staircases and you know, um, spaces in between the floorboards so that he could store bodies. Um, there were chutes that led straight to the um, to the cellar, which had a furnace in it that he used as like a crematorium. He, you know, had vats of acid that he would soak bodies in and, and all of these just unbelievably insane saw type 
horrifying torture chamber type things. Nobody really knows who uh, who his victims are exactly and how many there were, but some people have claimed that he's killed up to two, he killed up to 200 people. And part of it, what he, why it's called the Murder Hotel. This is, if you guys have watched um, American Horror Story, the season with Hotel, um, Evan Peters' character is based off of what the idea of A.J. H. Holmes was. So really just very sadistic, very into like, just wanted to experiment on human bodies because he was fascinated with anatomy and really terrible stuff. I will say, I actually am really impressed with this. Wasn't sure I was gonna feel about it. Really like it, blended out pretty nicely and good color match. So yeah, just to bring back the makeup in. So there's a lot of, of really just awful rumors and, and things like that. Now, let me, let me clarify. This dude was a bad dude. I don't like him at all. I'm not defending him. I just don't think those are real. Not all of them, at least. At the time he was caught, he was, he was caught in, 1895 for his long history of crimes. At that time, yellow journalism had just started to really um, consume <laughs> all of America, most of the world, honestly, most newspapers at the time were just trying to sell as many copies of newspapers as they possibly could. And so with the idea of yellow journalism is basically, journalists were not concerned with journalistic integrity, with giving the truth out to the consumer. They were, they were worried about selling newspapers. So they would come up with just absolutely blatantly, you know, lie stories that were just untrue because they were trying to sell more newspapers. Think like National Enquirer type, like my, my grandmother had a child with an alien and that's my, my cousin and my brother and my mother, like th those kind of like wild stories. And when, when he was caught, that was really kind of what journalists were focusing on. So a lot of the stories, a lot of the claims and stuff, there's no evidence to support it. It's just the newspaper articles. And unfortunately, as a historian, a lot of what we are looking for in primary source materials is newspaper articles. So I think that's kind of how all these rumors have been perpetrated for so long. And, you know, of course it's such a crazy story. Yellow journalism really is um, really taking effect right in this area, in this, in this time period that we're looking at. And because of that, because it is such a crazy story and there's just so many, like, <laughs> there's so many aspects to it that make for a great, as terrible as it sounds, it makes for a great entertainment. It's not entertainment, but it's almost like one of those, it's like watching a horror movie. You're like, there's no way there's somebody this sick. Because it was so almost unbelievable, because it probably was not real. It has been really just, I mean, the story has just been told time and time again throughout history. There's movie adaptations of it. There's film adaptations of it. There's books of it. And most people latch on to the idea that he really did build this factory designed just to murder people. And he killed hundreds of people in such a short period of time because he had created essentially a small scale, you know, murder murder factory. I keep saying murder factory. I gotta find another word for that. I don't know. All right, but let's go into what I think is the true story. There's so much out there that I can't promise, but this is what, after doing my research, after after doing my studies, this is what I think happened. So let's start. H.H. H. Holmes was actually burnt. <laughs> so much for not stuttering my way through this. <laughs> he was actually born Herman Webster Mudgett in 1861 on May 16th. Um, he was born in a small town in New Hampshire and his family was relatively well off. Everything that I saw, I mean, besides the ones that are really, really out there where they're just, like I said, they really are just making some of the really wild claims. Everything that I, I think to be true that I studied seemed to just say he had a normal childhood. He wasn't extra intelligent. He was just a normally smart kid. He actually was incredibly awkward because he had a lazy eye. And so he didn't like to make eye contact. He had friends and things like that, but he just was, you know, he wasn't unpopular, but he definitely experienced like some bullying and stuff like that because of his, and I, lazy eye might be the wrong thing. They said like his eye always cocked out. I always, I, I think of that as being like a, a lazy eye, but I don't know. His eye, he didn't like his eyes, let's, let, let, we'll go with that. Um, I talked about the possible abuse from his dad, but there's really nothing to support that, you know, we have any evidence of it. One of the big, big events that happened in his childhood, he was actually pushed in, he was very afraid of the doctor and he was pushed into a doctor's office. And at the time they didn't use like fake skulls for their little body diagrams. They used real human skulls. So the kids, the bullies who had shoved him in there made him stare face to face at this human skeleton. He recalls talking about it later in life that he experienced a sense of like extreme fear and then um, actually had this moment of, fascination. Like I really want to understand more about 
the human body. And that is kind of where he can track back. He, he recalled tracking back to when he first decided he was interested in medicine and he was no longer afraid of the doctor, but more with thought like, maybe I could actually be a doctor. That happened when he was, I think 13 is when that, uh, that occurred. And then he graduated from high school in 1877 when he was 16 years old. And he meets who will become his first wife. Her name is Clara Lovering and she was the daughter of a wealthy farmer. They actually eloped in July of 1878. And um, he had been working on her dad's farm, which is how they met. And then like, I think she was dating somebody else and he, there, there was a couple different stories. Like he basically threat, I know he threatened the dude. One said that the guy was abusive towards her. One said that they were just at like at a dance and he just showed up to the guy and was like, I'm gonna kick your ass if you don't leave her alone. And then she was like, I'm into that. So whatever, whatever happened, he, she had a boyfriend and he was like, no, no you don't. And the boyfriend was like, all right, I'm not dealing with this. And then the next day he told everybody in town that they were engaged. So he just went like zero to 60 real quick and she was into it. So they got married. Um, they did have a son. They had a son, Robert, on February 3rd in 1880. And during this time, more or less, my dude Holmes, we're gonna call him Holmes. I know his name is Herman still, but we're gonna call him Holmes because that's what he goes by through most of the story. Holmes was just kind of like existing. Like he did odd jobs. He taught for a little while. He worked at a grocery store for a little while, but he really wasn't doing anything major with his life. So he decides he is going to actually start studying medicine. He's always been interested in it. Um, he really thinks that this might be his his career passion. So he's like, all right, let me start um, apprenticing with the doctor who um, whose shop he was actually shoved into when he was 13 years old. So he begins apprenticing with him and um, that doctor's specialty is anatomy. So this is where he kind of gets this fascination with anatomy. He's, he's studying anatomy and he's, he's enjoying it. And he decides he's going to further his education and he goes to, I think it is, yeah, this is when he goes to the University of Vermont and he leaves Clara and Robert with Clara's family. So she's not there. And while she's not there, he's like, guess who's single? That's right, it's me. So he starts dating his landlord's daughter and they're like, they're pretty serious. Like everybody's like, are you guys engaged? Are you, I mean, he's got a wife and a baby. So obviously he's not engaged to her, but he's acting like he is. And while he's there, this isn't a funny story, but I laugh when I'm uncomfortable. So here we are. While he's there, he starts to bring his, uh, his work home a little bit. And his landlord's wife, who would be his, you know, mistress's mom, she, and, and I've heard, I've read two different sources. One said it was a cleaning lady. One said it was the landlord's wife. I don't know which it is. I like the story where it's the landlord's life more. So that's why I went with that. But the landlord's wife, um, she smells something weird coming from his room. So she goes in to see like, what did you leave like a ham sandwich in here? She, she checks under the bed and she finds the carcass of a fetus. So it was a dead baby and um, which horrible awful, like don't, don't do that. No dead babies under the bed, that's awful. Literally the thing of nightmares. But um, most likely what happened was this was a cadaver that was used in his medical school and he said he brought it home for research purposes. Um, and as terrible as it sounds to have a, a dead fetus, you have to understand like at the time, and I say fetus, I mean, it was a baby, it was a, it was a stillborn baby, but at the time infant mortality rates would have been much higher. So having a, a, a dead baby is, I mean, like I said, it's not kosher, but it's it, it's not like, babies died a lot back then. It's horrible, but it is what it is. So that happens and the, <laughs> they're not happy about it, but the landlord and his wife are basically like, like, don't do that again, which that's very forgiving in my opinion, but you know, it wasn't my house. So I would have kicked him out, but whatever. So he, this happens very weird. And everybody around him is just kind of like, he's just like too into, into his studies. Like it's, it's very unnatural how much he is um, infatuated with the study of the human body in a very like, I wanna dissect it way. Not like in a, oh, I'm just curious as to how it works. It's like, he like wants to really get in there. And I do believe that. I mean, there's some, there's some stuff that, there's some claims that I think is a little bit out there, but I think that he really did have this kind of a deep fascination with it. So yeah, so all this goes down. And um, while there's also claims that while this is happening, he is stealing cadavers and he is, he is claiming insurance, like um, the payouts for their life insurance policies while 
he is studying their bodies. Um, and I will say 100% my dude was, a, he was a con artist his whole life. He was not very good at it because almost everything he did, he got caught. But I think he was just a really good sweet talker. And so even when he would get caught with certain things, he would get out of a lot of it, uh, most of it. I mean, he, he should have been in jail his whole life. And, and really he only went to jail, I think twice, right, Nikki? I think he only went to jail twice. I'm asking, Nikki did a little bit of research. I did most of it though. So that's what I, I think it was only twice. It could have been another couple times, but they were never major enough to like really talk about. So, but he did, he was like stealing money. He was, he was committing insurance fraud. I don't know a hundred percent if the cadaver thing was true. Like if he was, but I'm, it, it was mentioned quite a bit in almost every source material I read. So I'm thinking it had some contention of truth to it. So whatever. There was, he just was always doing some weird, weird stuff. It was just not, it wasn't normal. So he does graduate from the University of Vermont though. And he decides to further his education at the University of Michigan. And this time when he moves, he decides to bring his family with him. Probably because it was a much larger difference distance um, from Michigan to New Hampshire than Vermont to New Hampshire. So. so they go to the University of Michigan and the marriage just unfortunately is not very healthy. Um, the neighbors uh, near them would say that they would hear them fighting all the time. A lot of times Clara would be seen around town with black eyes or bruises. So Clara stays with him for a little while. Ultimately, she decides that she's going to go back and live with her parents in New Hampshire and bring Robert with her. They actually never formally divorce, but effectively the marriage is done. They are no longer together. It does say a couple times, a couple places I read that he would go back and visit her, but I think it was more that he could see his son um, unless that he was trying to like make this marriage work. It was, it was done and he was pretty happy about it. So once she's gone, he continues to just play around. I mean, he didn't care about, <laughs> he didn't care about faithfulness when they were still trying to make their relationship work technically. So, so once she was gone, he really had no reason to, um, to maintain faithfulness. So yeah, so he's, he's back to being a womanizer. In this time, actually, it was 1882 when he went to the University of Michigan, he began to date a woman and she actually, this is after Clara had left and she actually winds up finding a letter under the bed and it is signed from Clara and it says your wife, Clara. And so she, this lady thought that he was, you know, about to marry her. That wasn't the case. So she got really upset, actually went to the school and said, um, this isn't okay. He's, and at the time it was not okay to basically lead a woman on. Like if you were courting somebody, it was with the intention that you wanted to marry them. So yeah, so she was very upset by it. The school threatened to expel him, but he convinced them that she was, not telling the truth. And then when he graduated, he actually went to one of his professors and was like, oh no, that was true. But well, like, what you gonna do now? So be better, like, just don't do that. Anyway, he graduates in 1884 and he goes back to New Hampshire for a little while. And then he ends up going to New York for a little while where he gained this really bad reputation of being a debt falter is what they, I, what they called it in the article. And I like the way that they said it. Basically he would skip out on all of his payments, like anything that he could not get by with not paying, he would do it. And a womanizer. He was like, he was, he was single and ready to mingle, let me tell you guys. So he got engaged or tried, got, tried to get engaged two more times up in New York and it didn't really stick. So he was kind of like, all right, well, people are starting to know me now and not for good reasons. So let me go ahead and make a change. So he decides to leave New York. When he leaves New York, he travels around a little bit, but he ends up in Chicago in May of 1886. And on his way to Chicago, he had uh, been in Minneapolis and he met Murda Belknap. And Murda came from a very wealthy family and he decided he was going to marry her for her father's inheritance. He marries her. He is still married to Clara. He never divorces Clara. So now he's technically a bigamist. They move to Chicago. Sorry, my notes are very hard to read sometimes. Move to Chicago and um, he wants to begin working at a, a drugstore. So he wants to be a pharmacist and he has to take the pharmaceutical board test to be um, qualified to sell drugs. So he takes the test, he passes, and the announcement in the newspaper lists him as passing as H.H. H. Holmes, Henry Howard Holmes. And that is the first time that he is he uses that name, that alias. And um, pretty much he goes by that for the rest of his his life. He does you know, use variations of it, but the nice thing about H.H. H. Holmes was um, he could change it around. So he'd be like, 
No, he's like, they'd be like, we're looking for Henry Howard Holmes. And he'd be like, oh, well, that's so funny. My name is actually um, Hank Howard Holmes. That's, it's wild. That's, you know, coincidence, but not me. Sorry. Not, nay, nay, keep, keep going. Pass along. So yeah, so it kind of worked out for him. He used it. I mean, he... <laughs> He worked out for him swindling people. So did it work out that well? Well, for him, I guess, but whatever. I will say it's just to take a little pause. I use the Ciate London setting powder and I, I freaking love it. It's just beautiful. It's got a beautiful finish on it. It, I, I really like that. That's one of my favorite setting powders that I've used recently. So like, <laughs> thanks Ipsy. Yeah, so let's go back to our, our good friend, uh, Mr. Holmes here. So they moved to Chicago. He has his pharmaceutical degree now. He's able to, um, to legally sell drugs to the public. He actually, before he finds a job, he opts to buy a plot of land. And this plot of land is at 701-703-63rd 63rd Street in Englewood because he's always thinking about, he's always thinking, he's not a good criminal, but he's always thinking about how he can keep from being the one tied down to it. He actually opts to put it in his wife and his mother-in-law's name. So it's not actually associated with him. When he does this, um, there on the same street, there is a, uh, a little pharmacy that he winds up getting a job at. This is one of the real, easy places to see how much misinformation there is on this case, because most of the, the articles and the things that you'll read or hear about say that it was an elderly couple who owned it, or it was a widow who owned it. And he basically, you know, decided, oh, I'm going to, you know, really make them trust me. And then I'm going to, um, to get rid of them. So some claims say that he actually killed the husband who was sick and then he killed the wife. Um, some say that the husband was already dead and he just killed the wife. It's not true. He bought the land from them. He didn't kill it. He didn't kill them. He bought this pharmacy from them. They were both young and they lived well past his execution. So, I mean, and you can go visit their graveside. So that is the, that one of the places where you can clearly see that people say things that just don't line up with the story. So he does buy the pharmacy and they continue living in the same area, but they are no longer involved in it. And when he buys the pharmacy, he um, he also begins construction on what will be the hotel. Like I said, my man's was always trying to pull one over on everybody he worked with. So he would constantly buy things on credit, not pay it back. Anything he could do to avoid paying and to make money, he would do. His business is really successful. He begins to take in um, a lot of assistance, like young, pretty women because that's what he was all about. He was about money, he was about women. That's what he liked. He starts taking on assistance and a lot of his assistants he wound up having affairs with. While he's doing this, like I said, he is constructing his two-story building. It started off as just a two-story building and the idea was he was gonna put a business on the bottom level and he was gonna put apartments on the level above. So that way he could have the business running and he could have his employees live there if they wanted to. He could live there if he wanted to. Other people could live there if they wanted to. He was trying to make as much money off of this property as possible. So the building is um, constructed and it definitely has some like weird aspects to it. I think that what we know about it is very over play. Like I don't think it had quite the amount of like hidden tunnels and everything that it was described to have, but it definitely had, like there was one, it had a hidden compartment in between the floors. That is, I believe um, in like the actual layout of the, the like the, the blueprint of the building. They actually do have evidence that there was this hidden compartment in one of the rooms under the floorboards. Um, there was also a back staircase that you could only get to like through a trap door in the second story bathroom for some reason. So there were some weird things, but a lot of the stuff that um, like the shoots and stuff that they talk about like for the bodies, like most likely it was like a laundry chute that just went down to the basement because a lot of houses had that at the time. So there's no evidence that he had like body disposal things included in it. I mean, I guess it's possible, anything's possible, but like, it just, I don't, I, I find that a little bit hard to believe after reading what I read, but who knows. Of course we talked about, he didn't want to pay any bills, like any bills at all. So he would do anything he could to manipulate his way out of them. He's constructing this building. He's not paying anybody for it. A steel company decides to sue him because he hasn't paid them. And when they sue him, he, he actually is able to get out of, he has to go to court and he has to fight it. But there was one steel beam that was just slightly smaller than what was agreed upon in the um, contract that they signed. And because of that, it basically 
negated the entire contract and he was able to get by without paying for it. He also put a safe in the bottom, like in the cellar story of his building and he bought it on credit and then refused to pay the debt, but he had put concrete walls around it. So they went in and they were like, we're gonna repossess it. And he was like, all right, but you can't damage the building. And they spent almost like a week, I think, trying to get it out and then they couldn't get it out. And they were just like, I guess it's yours. Like, <laughs> what are we gonna do? But I feel like they had a, they could have called the cops on that one, but I don't. There's so many circumstances where you're like, how did he not get arrested for that? Like it's so clear, but no, my dude just kept living. So yeah, so he's always trying to pull one over on people. Now in 1890, he actually sells the pharmacy that is not in the building. So he's built this, this his little building. He's got the business on the bottom story and he's got his apartments on top. So he decides to sell the pharmacy. He sells the pharmacy and it, was a scam as well. Basically he had bought everything that was in stock on credit and he had not paid any of the <laughs> any of that back. So when the new owner gets control of the building, the people show up who have given him the credit to buy all his stuff and they say, we need our money. And he's like, what are you talking about? I thought all this was paid for. And they're like, it's not though. So just always doing something shady, always trying to pull somebody up. Um, they There is a story about an investor who showed up to share some info with, I believe the new owner of this pharmacy. Oh, and I forgot to mention, for some reason he sells the pharmacy. He has all these issues with the new owner, but he still hangs out there. Like they, he's, I really think he was just a really good sweet talker and he could just convince anybody that like, oh, this is just a misunderstanding type person because the the farm the new pharmacy owner even with all the issues that were created by him buying all you know the debt and everything that Holmes left him the, he just just was like no it's fine you can still hang out here like we're cool still but like don't it's, it's like it's shady but like we're fine so anyway so he would still hang out there and one day an investor showed up to share information about Holmes to the new um owner and there's a couple of different accounts but more or less most likely what happened is this guy had some sort of a fit like a seizure or a stroke or something and and Holmes was the first one to make it to the guy. He goes to his side and he pours some sort of a black liquid into his mouth and then the man dies. So more than likely what happened was just an, uh, an opportunity arose and he saw a way to fix the salute, <laughs> fix the issue before it was actually an issue. So nobody ever knew what the man was going to tell him. And I mean, honestly, they had no way to prove that he actually had killed him. He said that he was trying to help him and it just didn't work. We'll never know. That Most people think that was the first person that he actually killed. Now, going back a little bit, um, in July of 1889, a young couple had began to work for, for Mr. Holmes and they were Ned and Julia Connor. Ned worked, um, the way I understood it was there was actually like a jewelry section um, in his store and Ned worked at the jewelry counter. So Julia would come over and visit and she wound up developing a friendship with Holmes and then she wound up developing a romantic relationship with Holmes. Well, of course, you know, they're all under the same roof and it's just shady. And so, now remember he's still married to Murda. She lives in the house too. So this, they're just doing whatever they feel like. Well, Ned catches on and of course he is understandably upset and he decides he is going to file from, for divorce and he is going to leave Julia there. He also leaves their, I believe she was six years old, their daughter Pearl. And um, and he leaves and, and Julia becomes really entangled with, um, with Holmes at that point. They begin to get involved in financial endeavors together. Holmes takes out debts in her name. He makes her the co-owner of certain businesses so that way he can default on the debt and put it on her because it's kind of was his MO the whole time. So this starts to happen. And then, um, like I said, there's really not a lot of certainty about what what went down. But what I believe to, happen was, to have happened was um, Julie fell pregnant. She, gotten pregnant, they were trying to give her an abortion and either the abortion went awry or he intentionally killed her and then he wound up killing Pearl. But what we do know is um, July of 1891, they were not seen again. So they are thought to be the, the two next victims of Holmes. I believe he said they went to Europe. He said most of the time when like people went missing, he would say, oh yeah, they went off to Europe. Like they just were, they're living their best lives over in Europe. But we know that they were never heard from again. So 
let's take a little break. Um, let me just talk about some of the products that I've used as well. I love the lipstick. It's a very light nude shade, but it's so buttery and soft. And the eyeshadow primer is pretty nice. Um, it's very white, which I actually like. I think it's gonna make those colors pop really well. But um, so far, every product that I've used, I've been a fan of, which I wasn't expecting. I mean, I always hope for the best, but you know, sometimes you get a product and you're just like, nah, I wish you were better. But these are all pretty good right now. So yeah, I'm enjoying this. Um, I'm gonna do highlighter and then we're gonna jump into the palette, which is of course the highlight of this whole video. I hope you guys are enjoying this. I know this is a lot of information. There's a lot of people. I'm still very nervous. So there are points where I'm like stuttering and I'm looking at my notes too much. And I'm sorry for that. I promise if I, if I start doing stuff that I have to research the hell out of, I'll get better at it. But I just, it was a big undertaking and I am not the undertaker. Nay, nay. Also, I keep saying nay, nay because it's what Bailey says. And I just, I wanna shout her out as much as I can in this video. She's so good at this and I'm, I, I'm in awe. It's so, it's so challenging. Anyway, back to the story, back to the story. Around the same time, once again, ever, ever, always trying to, to find a scam, Mr. Holmes decides he is going to start a glass spending business and find investors for that. So he starts this glass spending business. He, um, he puts a furnace in his basement, but there's no evidence that he ever did anything in glass spending. He never like produced any glass, but he found investors who invested money. This is, I think, I think that furnace is, is was just put in there for like the, the effect. But this is where a lot of people say like, oh, he had a crematorium in his basement because he did have a giant furnace down there. So like, why, why else would he have one if he's killing people and like, makes body disposal a little bit easier. Do I think he probably used it to dispose of some of the bodies he actually killed? I it probably, he, he probably did. It, I mean, it's convenient, but I just don't think that it was put in with the intention of like, oh, it's gonna be a crematorium for me to like dispose of the 200 people I murdered here. In 1892, he employs a typewriter named Emmeline Sigrad. I think I'm saying that right. They of course begin an affair. She is there for a little while, I think just about a year. And then um, once again, she just kind of disappears. I believe he took out a couple debts and things in her name as well, but I did not see any proof of that. I just think that that's like, that's kind of what he did with everybody. And she went missing. And when people started to ask about like, wait, what happened to Emmeline? He was like, well, she went off to Europe to get married. So once again, he's just telling people, you know, that she's off, she's, she, you know, found love and I'm, I'm already married to two other people. So I was like, go be you. So at the end of 1892, that's the same time that Emmeline really goes missing. We have um, people starting to get really excited for the World's Fair. The World's Fair was a big festival that was put on in Chicago in honor of the 400th anniversary of Columbus landing in uh, in America. So this was a huge thing. People were coming from all over the country. I watched one video and it was really funny because I hadn't thought about it, but the whole thing with like people in hotels and everything at that time, you weren't making a reservation. Like there was no hotels.com. There was no Airbnb. Like you would just go and you would find, you know, a hotel or a motel or, you know, somebody's house and pay them to stay there. And so knowing that and knowing that our friend is a, a major scam artist, he really is like, oh, there's some money in this. So he really quickly decides to um, surround up some investors and to, um, to install a third floor into his uh, hotel and who is um, his two story little place and make it into a hotel. He's saying third story is going to be just for hotel purposes. But honestly, this is where the lore comes in that he would like, people would come and he would take them in and then they'd be there for a night and he'd kill them. There's just no evidence of it because there's no records of it. Now, somebody could argue like, well, he probably just didn't keep any records because he knew he was gonna kill them. I don't know. I find that hard to believe, but like maybe, maybe. I don't, I don't see that though. I think more likely what it was was he constructed a third story because he wanted to run insurance scams and he wanted to, not insurance scams, he, not, that's later. He wanted to get investors to um, invest in something that was never going to be a hotel. He was like, let's, let's, let's get some money from rich people who are thinking like, oh, we're gonna turn a profit and then I just won't take anybody in. Most likely what he was using the third story for was he ha also ran a scam where he would buy a lot of furniture and pricey items on credit and then he would sell them for cash and then he would never pay his 
debt. Like he would never pay his credit card bills or, or anything like that. And like, that's not a good, that's not a good financial policy, but for some reason it worked for him. So he did that for a while too. And they said a lot of the rooms in the third story were used to store his furniture and stuff that he bought. It, with the intention of selling. Let's talk about Minnie and Nanny Williams. He met Minnie, she was a young actress, she was from Boston and her and Nanny were orphans, but they had been adopted by a very wealthy Texan. Um, I believe he was like, he was a reverend doctor. And so he had a huge following and he had a good amount of money. Well, from all accounts, Mr. Holmes was of course interested in their wealth. So he met Minnie they began a relationship and they began a relationship, I think he met her in 1890, yeah. So he met her in 1890 and they talked for a very long time. They would write letters back and forth to each other. He professed his love to her. And then he convinces her in 1893 to move to Chicago to be with him. And there's no records, I believe she was his third wife, but there's no records of it because he was still married to Murda and Clara at the time. So most likely what happened was he was, there's there's one, I found one date that said that he married her on January 17th, I think. No, that's his fourth wife. God, this man, he was never satisfied. He needed more money and more wives and like, I get the money thing, but the, that's a lot. That's a lot to worry about. There's so many people to worry about. It's just, oh God. Anyway, no, not January 17th. That's Georgiana. All it says is that he most likely married her in 1893. So, he marries her and in order to get her inheritance, he also has to get rid of her sister. So what is believed to have happened was that Nanny, her sister came to visit her. And while she was there visiting, he took them both out at the same time. We don't really know a lot about what happened. We just know that they both went missing around the same time. Neither one was heard from again. And this is significant because they owned land in Texas where their adopted father was or had been, because I believe he had passed at the time already. It was their inheritance that he was after. They had land in Texas and he was interested in getting that land. At the end of the World's Fairs, jump back forward. So that was in 93, they married and then she was gone pretty quickly after that. The end of 93, after the World's Fair, Chicago took a, a little bit of a hit economically because so many people had been there touring and then everybody left at the same time and it was kind of just this this universal downturn. So the economy wasn't great. And then uh, we also have the fact that he's been doing nonstop illegal things in here up in the city for like three years and people are starting to catch on. So I think it was a combination of like the wealth just wasn't there that it, it had been. And then he also was now like, the, the police were a little bit on his trail. So he decided he was going to leave. Really quickly, I just used the first color. I used Rose Tattoo and I love the formula. I really am a big fan of Estate and I'm not surprised that I like it, but I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. So I'm gonna actually go in with Toasty now and do a little bit of a blending out of it. But like, I'm, I'm very satisfied with what's happening on my face right now. Back to the story though. Holmes decides Chicago is not the place for him any longer. So he decides to leave and he travels around for a little while, but he ends up in Texas because of course, Minnie and Nanny had their land there. And that was partially why he wanted to get rid of them was because he wanted to um, to be able to, to, to claim that land. So he goes, he takes on, I don't know at what point this, this happens. I, I don't know if it's before he hits Texas or if it's after he hits Texas or what happens. But he ends up married to Georgiana Yoke on January 17th in 1894. She is with him. He begins this kind of a scam where he would steal people's horses and then sell them um, and make a lot of money doing it. And he gets caught for that. So this is the first time we actually see him suffering some sort of a punishment for all of the, um, the all of the really bad, uh, deals and things that he has done. I mean, at this point, we're probably sure that he's killed a few people and he's definitely been, con you know, committing scams throughout his entire life. But this is the first one we really see him like face punishment for. So he does go to jail. And while he's in jail, his cellmate, who is Marion Hedgepeth, 
is also a scam artist and a, a a criminal. Obviously, he's a criminal. He's in jail, but he's a pretty he's a pretty bad one. I think he's in there for like 25 years. So he's done some shady things in his life as well. And they have this really similar personality and a very similar outlook on like crime and and what they like to do for crime. And you know, they're just really bonding over their love of of stealing money from people. So while he's in there, he hatches this plan that when he gets out, he's actually going to commit like the big time insurance fraud on himself. He's gonna fake his own death and he's gonna get an insurance payout of $10,000 for it. But in order to complete this, he has to find a, a lawyer who is willing to work in some shady areas because obviously the lawyer has to be the one to go collect the money. He has to be okay with lying and, and you know putting himself at risk getting caught as well. So Marion goes, well, I know some shady people, so I think I can help you. But if I'm gonna help you, I need a little bit of money for it. So he asks him for $500 of the 10,000. And now, and remember back then that's a ton of money. That's like, I, I don't know if you can find that. Can you find that really quick? All right, so Nikki says that when he bought his drugstore originally, it was like 50 bucks. So that's a ton of money. That's, a, that's, that's, that's some like Bezos money. That's a lot of money. It's not quite Bezos money. Nobody has Bezos money, but like, that's a lot of money. Anyway, so yeah, so he's like, all right, I'll give you $500. I'll make my escape. So he sets him up. Holmes gets out. I guess he was only in for a couple months. I guess whatever they convicted him with, it was not that serious, but he was in there for a couple months. When he gets out, he decides I'm going to recruit his longtime accomplice and friend. And that is Benjamin Pitzel. Pitzel? Pitzel? Pizza. Benjamin Pizza. I had practiced saying that so many times, but words are so complicated for me. Nikki's got information for us. Yes, Nikki. $500 was, a a was approximately 15, we'll call it $15,000 back then. And $10,000 was almost $285,000. So it was a huge payout that my dude was trying to get, which, you know, I don't agree with stealing, but like, I mean, it do be like that sometimes though. So this was a really big, even the $500 payout was a huge chunk of money. So he gets out and he decides to recruit Benjamin Pizzell. I, I hope I'm saying that right. I'm really trying. It's just very complicated for me and I don't know why. And like I said, they had been friends for a long time. He had helped him in the past with a ton of his um, his schemes. They had a great working relationship and Pizzell had actually gone to jail uh, a little while before and that's kind of why they weren't in contact when um, when things started going down, like when uh, when my dude bounced out of Chicago. he They're both out of jail now and he recruits him and he says, hey, I want you to help me with this. But along the way they decide, let's make it Benjamin who was the one who was going to fake his own death and not H.H. H. Holmes. They get Benjamin's wife involved and they have, I, I saw a record that said they had six kids. I heard that they had five kids in almost everything that I read, but I don't know. So this is Pete Sell and his wife, Carrie. They have a bunch of kids, at least five, possibly six. I, five is the one that I heard the most, but like I said, I'm just throwing that out there. They get the entire family involved with the, with the lie because they need the wife to go identify the body and say, yes, that is my husband. And what they were gonna do is they were going to find a cadaver and they were going to make like an explosion happen in a lab and make it so that the body was like completely mutilated and unrecognizable and then they could go and claim the insurance. Well, they've been planning out for a while. Coming up to the day, Benjamin starts to get cold feet and he's like, I don't know if I should do this. What happens if we get caught? Then my family's gonna suffer. I just don't think this is a good idea. It's too dangerous. It's too much money. People are gonna catch on. There's no way we can hide it forever. AJ Holmes is kind of like, just take a day, you know, think about, calm down, take a breather. It's a lot, it's a lot to ask, it's a lot to do, but think about the payout, like we'll be okay. So he um, he tells him like, you know, just, just take a little bit of time and then we'll talk about it tomorrow. He gives him the night and then Benjamin comes over the next day and he's like, yeah, I can't do this. Like I thought about it and there's no way I can do this. And of course, we know how, uh, how, how Mr. Holmes liked to handle these kind of situations, um, he decided, well, the best way to handle this is just to actually kill him and then claim the insurance on him. So instead of using the cadaver, he kills him and he sets the lab on fire like they had originally planned. And then he gets his wife to go identify the body. She believes that she is identifying somebody else's body and that her husband is still alive, he's just in hiding. A.J. Holmes tells her, 
after we collect the insurance money, we need to leave because if we stay, it may look like it, they may catch on. And then if we're here, then it'll be easier to catch us. So if we leave and we try and go somewhere else, especially out of the country, I think he's really trying to convince her to go to Canada. So he was like, if we leave, then it will be much harder for them to be able to trace us back if they ever figure out that we were lying. And she's like, okay. So because of this, he also says, we can't all travel together. That's too dangerous as well. So I'll take your three middle kids and you keep your oldest and your youngest child. We'll meet back up when it's safe. So he takes with him Alice, Nellie, and Howard. I think their age range was, I'm guessing based on what I saw, was somewhere from like 13 or 14 to, um, to like maybe eight, seven or eight. Um, I don't know for sure, but that's kind of the vibe that I got. Like they were, you know, old enough to be able to, to survive on their own, but still very young. And he takes them and they travel around for a little bit. Now remember, Carrie still has no idea her husband's actually dead. She thinks that he's just in hiding and that at some point they'll meet back up. They're traveling around. And of course, like this isn't an easy thing to keep up. He's got a wife who's traveling with him. Georgiana's still traveling with him. She has no idea that he's also got these three kids. And he's got Carrie and the other two kids that he's helping travel as well. So they, they do this for a, like, I think it was only a couple days, but they did travel around a good amount. So it could have been longer than that. But unfortunately, as you guys can predict with him traveling around with the children without any sort of other supervision, he at some point decides that the children are just more than he wants to deal with. And um, first he, in Indianapolis, he um, kills Howard. Um, I'm not sure, I, I believe they said that he actually like suffocated him with chloroform and then disposed of his body by burning him. I know they found his remains. It was either in a furnace or a chimney. I'm not sure I saw records of both. So I, it was some, he was somehow cremated the body, but he did not kill the girls at the same time. He actually um, took the girls up to Toronto and they were found in the basement of one of his rental houses in Toronto. I believe they had both been drugged, but I could be wrong about that as well. Like I said, there's a lot of different stories. Um, one story I heard said that they were found naked, um, but I only saw that in one source. So I'm not sure it's true. That particular source said that they thought that perhaps that meant that he had sexually assaulted them, but there is no proof of that. Um, knowing him and the womanizer he was, it actually wouldn't surprise me. It's horrible, but um, yeah, so he he does kill the children. For a while, he's still telling Carrie that they're fine. And somebody said, one article I read said that he was playing this kind of sick game of like cat and mouse. Like he almost like derived pleasure from the fact that he knew that her children were dead and, and, he, and her husband was dead and he was lying to her. I'm not sure that's actually what he was doing. I really think that it was more, he was just trying to like buy himself more time but it's very possible that he was, you know, somehow enjoying this, this kind of game with her as well. The police knew it was him though. They found the bodies of the kids. They, oh, I've, I forgot. How do they knew it was him? How did they know it was him, Andy? <laughs> well, why don't I tell you? Marion, our friend Marion, his, uh, his cellmate in prison, he never paid Marion. And Marion was pissed because Marion was like, bruh, I set you up and then you, pulled this off and now you're fleeing and they can't catch you. And guess what? I'm gonna tell them everything I know about you. And so with Marion's help, they wind up catching him and he is arrested on November 17th of 1894 in Boston. And when they arrest him, they begin to, you know, interrogate him and he's just absolutely doing everything he can to give them the wrong information. One day he tells them like, hey, I didn't kill anybody. I, you know, I might've committed some insurance frauds here or, you know, here and there, but I never killed anybody. I didn't do anything wrong. The next day he'd be like, yeah, I killed 27 people in my life. And he'd give them names and they'd be people who were still alive or they'd be people who had died of natural causes at the age of like 58. So they just had no way of proving what he was saying was true or not. Some people think that he was doing this maybe to be able to claim like an insanity plea. I don't think he ever copped that plea. And if he did, it didn't work anyway. Um, he was in fact convicted of, um, I think the only death that they actually convicted him of was um, Benjamin's, but it was enough in that time period for them to um, sentence him to be hanged. And he was hanged, I believe it was May 6th, but let me double, let me double check. May 7th. I was close. May 7th of 1896. So that is the story. It's a rough story. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of 
information that contradicts one another. There's a lot of people involved. There's a lot of people we're not actually sure if they're involved. It's definitely one of those cases that makes you think, like I said, I really, I chose it because I thought it was going to be easier to do than Jack the Ripper. I think it was, it, it was easier in the sense that we know H.H. H. Holmes, like he was caught, we know who he was, but there's almost as many questions as the Jack the Ripper case because we're not sure how many people he killed. We're not sure what is true and what is rumor. We're just not positive about really anything. So because of that, I think it makes it a little bit more challenging to research and to tell the story appropriately. I would love to know what you guys think about it. I mean, it definitely is one of those cases where I think a lot of people, the second they start studying it, they feel like they know everything about it and there's just no way for any of us to know everything. Um, we can all form opinions. We can all kind of like, you know, speculate on what happened, but, but there's just so many unanswered questions. There's so many things that we don't have actual records of. And like I said, that's probably because it was so long ago when it happened. It's also probably because the media really did, a, they did a number on it when they were retelling it. I know one of the, one of the documentaries I watched, he talked about the media was allowed to, um, I think at one point they were allowed to walk through the building. And this is one of the things, I, I read a couple of different things. Somebody said that he burned down the building in his original like murder castle in Chicago. He burned it down in 93 for insurance money and then didn't get the money from it because it's, it stayed tied up in like courts to get the payout. So he never wound up getting in the money from it. It definitely burned. I know it definitely burned, but I just don't know when. I saw another report that said that it burned in 95 which was after he was actually arrested and it was burned then. I saw another one that said he, it was burned after he was hung. I don't know. I don't know how that went down. I don't, but um, it did burn down. One report did say that the media was allowed to walk through it and that's where they came up with things like they saw the furnace down in the basement. And they said, oh, that was like a crematorium and that's how things like that ended up in the news. But like I said, because I don't know when the exact fire happened, I don't know how true that is. Um, it's definitely something to think about though. I think the media definitely did a number on it. And I guess that's my kind of takeaway from it is like, especially like even nowadays you see, it's just like check your sources, look at more than one article. Like that's, that's how I research and that's how I come up with my own ideas is like, I don't think you can take anything at face value ever. And I think you have to be, you know, willing to kind of dig through what is given to you and kind of come up with your own conclusions on this kind of stuff. But yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a sad case. It's definitely a hard case, no matter what. A lot of people died at his hands and, and that's not okay. Whether it was because he was an insane serial killer or it was because he was just a really selfish guy who was only concerned with money and didn't care who he had to hurt in order to like get his money. I don't know, sad case. A lot of people died and yeah, what do you guys think? What do you guys think? I'd, lo I'd love to know. Let me know in the comments what you guys think about this. I am sorry. I know I said a lot. I know I, I said um a lot and I know I did like a just like that. But this was very challenging for me, especially, <laughs> especially having so much information just to like spit out and so much that I was like, I don't really know even what I believe at this point. So yeah, uh, the palettes, I love it. I absolutely love it. I will say the black shade I wasn't a big fan of. Maybe it's because I used it wrong. I tried to use it as like a like a darkening, a darkening shade and it's a glitter pigment. And so maybe that was just like the wrong choice. But I don't think that it looks bad. I really kind of like what's happening with it. The gold shade's gorgeous. The, the brown and the orangey tones are really pretty. I do wanna do some mascara and see how that looks. And I'm gonna do that off camera because I think you guys have watched me do enough of my makeup and I will be right back. All right, this is the final look. I love it. I, I always, I tell Nikki, like I have to step away and like I fix my hair really quick and then I like see how it looks not in the harsh lights up close, like in a mirror in my bathroom. And I'm just like, I can always tell if I like it or if I don't like it at that moment. And I walked in and I was like, oh damn, I look really good today. So I really like all of the makeup that I use. It's shocking. I don't normally like every single piece of makeup when I'm trying all new stuff. But there's not one that I have a complaint about. Um, of course, I love Bailey's palette. I'm always gonna support her. I stand the hell out of her, but like, I'm so excited that it's as good as it is. Um, I love the gold color. Like I said, the only one I'm really not fond of is that black shade, but it, once again, if I used it differently, it might be a little bit better, but yeah. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I know it was a lot. I did a lot. I talked about a lot. I said, um, a lot. I'm sorry for that. 
But if you guys did like it, then please definitely give it a thumbs up. Let me know in the comments. That would mean an absolute ton to me. If you like seeing this kind of video, um, if you have topics you would like me to talk about or anything like that, like I would love to see that as well. But yeah, uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, I'm eating my hair. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, then consider doing that as well. We would love for you to be part of the Dark Angel family. As we're filming this, we actually hit a thousand subscribers yesterday. I was so excited. I can't thank you guys enough for the continuous support and the loving words and the people who have subscribed and who watch our videos. It means the absolute world to me. Um, we're so excited that in, in uh, just over just over a year, like a month past a year mark, we, at, we were able to hit a thousand subscribers. It's amazing and we're so thankful for it and we love you all very much um but yeah so other than that i hope you guys are all safe and healthy and you have a wonderful day and stay girly with a dark twist